started here. I don't know where Mariana is. I'm sure she's wrapping something else up with the, uh, the Marshall Festival. She has been so busy this week. Um, I know she's not here, but, you know, do a mental round of applause for her. Or, or a physical one. That's good, too. Physical. Physical is good. Yes, yes, yes. Um, she's been working so hard, so I'm, I'm sure she's racing around trying to get here. But uh, we want to get started, so we're, we're going to do that. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ben Walker. I'm a professor of, a professor of communication studies at SMSU. And I was asked to uh, host this, or host this, MC this tonight, um, mainly because uh, this was something that Marianne and I had actually thought about last year. I said, hey, we should, we should do something with poetry, right? We should do some sort of uh, reading and bring some people in and get our students rolling. And she's like, yeah, that would be so good. And I'm like, yeah. So this year we hosted a couple of workshops with our students uh, and we invited students to come in and we walked them through some basics of, of spoken word poetry. And tonight we brought in some what we call our expert panel who are going to be performing for you their poetry, but we also have our students here who are going to be performing for you as well. Um, we are super pumped about that. Um, so and I'll, I'll, I'll introduce them um, as we get going. Um, we're gonna start off first though with our expert panel. Um, one by one, I'm just gonna introduce them one by one. They're gonna, they can come up and then they can tell them, talk to you a little bit about themselves. And we're gonna rotate one by one. They're gonna tell a poem, uh, give a, perform, yeah, perform their poetry and uh, kind of rotate so you don't get tired of them one by one. And then we'll move on uh, to our students, okay? So uh, first up, we have um, uh, Nick. Where are you at, Nick? Awesome. All right, um, Nick's, Nick White, uh, he is a, a graduate of SMSU, um, and uh, I'm have, gonna have Nick come up, and he can introduce himself, tell him a little bit uh, about who you are, and uh, get us uh, rolling. Give a hand for Nick. All right. Hello. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Um, as Ben mentioned, I'm a graduate at SMSU. I graduated in 2013 with a bachelor's in creative writing. Uh, I started doing slam freshman year a little bit, kind of. Got better at it. Started hosting uh, open mics at the Daily Grind, as they were so graciously to let me come in there and yell words at people. And uh, since then, I've been performing, working on music, all that kind of stuff since I've been back in the cities. Uh, yeah, that's about it. Still haven't made nationals, but I'm, I've got so goddamn close, it hurts. So, uh, anyways, I don't like to preface pizza, pieces. I almost said pizza. Uh, because I don't want to spoil anything. I can't, you gotta... Oh! <laughs> Is this better? All right, okay. He literally wants me to yell at people. All right. So this first one, it's an acronym. It's called GIRL, and it stands for Guy in Real Life. <clears throat> Why do we act this way? Going toe-to-toe -to -toe with testosterone, ready to squeeze boners and throw punches, all for the sake of obeying that rogue Y chromosome. Mom runs the home and dad leads the house, and you better stay devout because that's a religion you can't denounce. Church and state under the same roof, and do your damn chores before you go to your room with no dinner. Before society expects men to put on muscles and get into fights over crushes and like cars and sports and be attracted to women only for their looks. Why do we act this way? Going to the gym day in and day out in order to impress a set of legs without talking to the lips attached. Eyes up, I'm talking about these ones. In our society, men tend to equate with crude humor and outstanding temperaments. You gotta be rowdy and ready to punch your friends after just a couple beers and you gotta love the bottled piss because it puts all that hair on your chest, all that manliness and shit. So go ahead and crack another one and holler at some boobs. Then get in your loud ass truck and honk at some boobs on your way to the corner store where you buy the sports magazine. Where you can read up on manly men who get paid to be tough and play games and have articles in between the pages of the swimsuit edition. Yes, more boobs. But enough about boobs. I'll stop boobing around boobs and get straight to the boob <clears throat> boobs. Oh, sorry. Why do we act this way? How about a real life example? How about me? I'm a man by law and I have the genetic makeup to prove it. I've even held the generic reputation of being promiscuous and having a temper. So what? I've used my charm to take to the sheets and it's given me outstanding social skills without having to use alcohol. Unlike those that would judge me for not getting blacked out and using roofies in college like I was supposed to. So I could wake up the next morning, look a human being in her face and tell her I honestly don't remember her name. Fuck that. 
I respect myself too much. I respect people too much. So why do we act this way? Maybe next time I'll skip the wit and shit talk and go straight to throwing knuckles when I get called pussy by some douchebag at the gym who's lifting his weights the wrong way because they're too heavy, but at least he looks tough. Especially when he leaves them out racked for all to see that he never learned how to clean up after himself. But he dresses to match his bros and they all get drunk to hit on the same females and refuse to know them. They just want someone who will wear a jersey at a homecoming game because that's all it is. It's a game to these players. But that's a real man to take advantage of a woman or abuse her physically and emotionally or leave her with three children like my grandfather I never want to meet. Is that a real man? I'm a little confused. Why do we, they, males, people act this way? I don't know. I'm fucking confused. And this is no attempt to use those abused. I'm not trying to gain anything here. I'm just trying to show you that decent human beings still exist. I'm just a guy in real life, a girl, if you will, who recognizes how real it can fucking get, and I've gotten really good at listening. So call me pussy. Call me faggot. Call me bitch. I've heard it a thousand times, and it still has not changed shit, because I don't need to live by your definition of man to understand who I am. At the end of the day, I'm just a guy in real life remembering how to breathe, and I'm man enough that you could call me a girl. All right, thank you so much, Nick. Um, uh, next up, we're going to have uh, Trevino. He's going to come on up and uh, introduce himself and share his poetry. Give him a hand. Hello, my name's Trevino Brings Plenty. So I'm coming in from Portland, Oregon. I've uh, been here since Wednesday. It's been, it's been fun and exciting and action-packed. Lots of conversations, so, and I take off back to Portland tomorrow to do my boring life. <laughs> a few, a little advice for the, the, the students who haven't been up on this microphone or in front of a large group of people. Uh, I would say, imagine a hula hoop going down from the top of your head all the way down. As it goes down, relax that body part. And continue to breathe and just keep going down as it goes down relax that all the way to the floor once on the floor you should be calm and be ready to do this I still get nervous when I do this so just accept that's part of the job here we go again I sat in the chair in Lucy's new apartment. Another lady was there who I never met. She introduced herself and said her name was Alicia. She sat at my feet facing me. She had blue eyes, auburn hair, fake and baked skin. She asked if I was Native American. I said, yes. Native Americans are so cool, she said. They are very spiritual, and oh my God, there is the great spirit. You have a beautiful culture. It's not all mine, I said. <laughs> Native Americans have so much wisdom, she said, and leaned closer to me. Do you know any sacred stories? Can you tell me a story? Okay, I said. This one took place in old times. There was a lone cavalry soldier. He was stationed at an abandoned fort in South Dakota. There were Lakotas not far off. The Lakotas watched this man and wondered at his strangeness. They saw him cleaning the fort. They thought he was crazy to be alone. Then they saw him trying to communicate with a wolf that had white front paws. Alicia interrupted me and said, that is the storyline for Dances with Wolves. <laughs> yes, it is, I said. 
Then Alicia stood behind me and started to run her fingers through my hair. It's unfair, she said. Indian men have such beautiful hair. It's so dark and thick and soft. You are a beautiful man. Thanks, I said. But you know I have more of that beautiful hair around my cock. Alicia quickly pulled her hand away. You're disgusting, she screamed. Maybe so, I said, but your ideas of me are just as repulsive. Then Alicia sat up, sat on my lap and kissed my cheek. She stood and left the apartment. There you go, Trevino, Lucy said. You have a great way with the ladies. Yeah, I know, I said. The crazy ones come to me like flies to dog shit. Thank you. Thanks so much, Torino. All right. Next up, we have our next poet. Ooh, ooh. We're good? Okay, good. Next up, we have Sarah, and she's going to come up, introduce herself, and uh, perform some of her poetry. Give her a hand. I have to follow the tall guy. I even have heels on. You know, you make a shoe decision before you leave the house. Sometimes it's a good one, sometimes it's not. Well, bonjour, everybody. I'm Sarah Agatone House, uh, Indigenous Cause. I'm from Fond du Lac. Fond du Lac, Minnesota. It's a reservation in Minnesota. And um, I'm an artist and a mother. And um, I'm really honored to be here. And thank Judy for having me come down. It's a whirlwind adventure. Can you hear me in the back? How about you guys in the restaurant? Can you hear us? (laughs) Woo! (laughs) I hope you can hear his, because that was really great. Okay. (laughs) Maybe I can make a Louisiana purchase on my determination of your soul. Pay three cents an acre for your beating mother heart I cannot own. A little liberty and justice for just us? I'm calling it time of death, 1492. Your wandering fingers in steel to mold us mold her into your cast. Cast bronze historical markers, cast bronze shoes on our feet, cast us down, cast us as past tense and knick-knack your shelf as a remembrance of what was. Chalk the boundaries, outline the bodies. As long as the waters flow, dammed up, and the grasses grow, cut down, stand up in honor of what you cannot see. From this angle, my face pressed against the dirty floor, I can see the maggots in your apple pie. These words, bombs bursting in air, in a way as courteous as the Arawaks were to Columbus. I fold this star-strangled banner into folds of four, declare us all veterans of the foreigners' war, and hand it back to you to hang upon the moon. (laughs) Oh, say, will you ever see in the dawn's earliest light The plight created by this fight, the rows of the unmarked graves of the broken, the believers, and the deceivers. Do you understand the charges against you? Possession of stolen humanity, murder in the first degree of the remaining three-fifths of me, perjury for the lies and perjury for the omissions. This tribal court finds you guilty orders a psychiatric evaluation of your historical amnesia. We have the right to remain silent or screaming. Remain right here. Remain who we are. Let us build villages of our spirits, gather the children closely, warn them of the minds placed in their past, blowing away their sweet crass braids. Show them the maps of bridges cleverly created by our backs. Let us carry them across with prayers to protect their sweet promise. I write you this. In emancipation, proclamation, demarcation, exclamation, declaration of my independence. 
and the land given away free in the home of the enslaved. All right, thank you, Sarah. All right, um, so we've had uh, one, two, three of our expert uh, poets come up, and we're going to do another round again, so we didn't get bored with them. We have different styles, different voices, and we want to keep it fresh. So um, we're going to invite Nick back up to uh, perform his uh, second poem of the night. Thanks, Nick. All right, hopefully you remember who I am. If not, I hope you're taking a cab home. <laughs> I secretly discovered the real me a while back. Started coming out to my friends, but they already knew. My father had always wanted me to play sports, but he knew it wasn't meant to be when I finally told him, Dad, I'm a nerd. I like to getting together with my friends just to kill shit. Whether it's mutants, aliens, zombies, or 12-year-olds online, I wear my newfound gamer pride like a badge, but for some reason, the ladies are not impressed. How is it I could walk up to a girl at the bowling alley, tell her I have the top six high scores in Pac-Man, and she'd still say no to dinner with me? Come on, girl, look up my initials, A, S, S. Now, assume I could assist with your needs when I got rapid fire trigger fingers like these. Don't make me beg for a baby, please, because in my virtual reality, chivalry is not so fucked up, and you, whoo, you could be my 8-bit damsel in distress. <laughs> but I could have a bad attitude, too. Shit, some days my gamer tag should come with a parental advisory sticker. I hurl out more curse words at my TV in five minutes than Wu-Tang could in an hour, so you know I got that dirty talk down. And yeah, I'm a player, but there'd be no plan when you came around. The only time I cheat is when I use L1, R1, left, down, right, up, or I absolutely need more than one master ball. Shit, I've had so many successful marriages and role-playing games, but I have yet to find a woman who is proud of my dragon kills. I have yet to find someone who can contend with my combo skills. I have yet to find a date that could beat me in Mortal Kombat. <laughs> now, of one thing I'm sure, I'm not too picky, but there is a formula. An old boss of mine once told me if you find her attractive, she plays video games, and she watches anime, you fucking hold on to her forever. <laughs> it's like the holy grail of gamer nerds. I've found two of three, but never the full trinity. But with my newfound honesty, I believe it is my destiny to find not only a companion in life, but every cooperative video game I buy. I'm tired of getting yelled at because I want to play a match after work. I'd rather get yelled at because I took the last good batteries and now her controller's not turning on. <laughs> Shit, I used to hide it. Girls would come over early, catch me playing World of Warcraft. All I could say was, it's not porn. <laughs> now, I got Game Informer covers on my wall. Fuck it. I'm a gamer nerd. All I need is a steady income for new games and a Netflix subscription for the down days. Now, don't get me wrong, it's, it's, not, it's not a sad loner's existence. I don't live in my parents' basement, okay? It's a happy hermit life. I'm just contently questing for someone to share my shell with, and... If she has the fucking high scores to pull it off, someday she could be Mrs. A.S.S. -S. All right, thank you so much, Nick. Um, I'm lucky that uh, my wife is also a fellow nerd, so we're, I, I found mine. Keep, keep searching, Nick. You, you'll get there. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to invite uh, Trevino back right up. Come on up. So we're briefly talking about Doctor Who over here. Um, I'm a Linux fan myself, so change of pace. I am in the reservation of my mind. I saw the best lives of my reservation destroyed by manifest destiny, hungered in commodity lines, passed out, broke down in cars eight hours until the gas was gone and froze in a South Dakota snowstorm, who inhaled lines of meth driving along empty highways, believed in American dreams, held cigars and turned to wood, looked at America again and turned to a salt pillar, 
who roam the streets reeking of piss and suck cock for crack, raped their sons in a drunken loneliness, prostituted their cousin in Pasco, Oregon for shots of H who in asylums received electroshock, sang death songs learned and understood only by the deceased, who were stolen, shaved, and shaved, taken to boarding school, screamed with angels and broke their bones, cut rivers into their wrists, searched for solace in the yellow crested moon, who constructed intricate nooses, wrapped them around their necks, and swung in HUD house basements, who adopted children, slept on bus benches like angry birds, and wandered in who they were, who were sterilized by IHS, born FASD, sat before the penumbra of TV commercials, lost their sight and feet to diabetes, whose hearts were crushed at wounded knee, obliterated by Mount Rushmore, demonized by Crazy Horse Monument, who knelt before the cross, ate the flesh, drank the blood, were raped by Catholic priests, recited a thousand by a thousand Hail Marys for every sin that shined like a blanket of stars as warm as smallpox and as cold as biblical heaven, who carried a photo of George Armstrong Custer, raged a curse at the photo, held their sin sick buddy other, under the Burnside Bridge, drank can after can of Lysol, who huffed gasoline-soaked rags, laughed in the Portland streets, cut their long black hair by the radioactive glow of salmon, who were gunned down driving into the American dream, beaten to death for talking their language, burned alive for the word of God, who looked down untied to girder 60 stories above Portland, New York, Seattle, San Francisco, San Jose, Los Angeles, looked down at busy ants building big, meaningless, abstract rooms, who didn't care anymore after mother's death, pulled out their eyelashes, dug their fingernails into their scarred legs, sat in a coma of gold cobwebs that wove their arms to the sun, hidden behind thick clouds, who threw themselves into fiery lakes of literature, Harjo, Alexi, Ortiz, Welch, Mamaday, Lewis, who stood in faith on a different bridge every night through pill bottles into the Willamette River, cursed their hands, dependability, ate newspaper strips, sipped every ink character with their head lost in the streetlight music, strolled back to city park campsites, who said they were Crazy Horse or Jesus or Sitting Bull or Judas or Chief Bigfoot, signed their life to the white noise of history burned on every page, ripped out of the Book of Longing, who stole horses, called it freedom, leaned against padded rooms filled with wild horses strewn with sinewy strands of madness, rattled the cages, screamed from the rusted bars, who raged on top of bare butte, fucked next to each Black Hills tree, scratched ghostly promises of love written under blue moonlight on purpled pages, who mended stolen skulls in museums, angrily searched for pieces of the hoop, found severed breasts, dead Indian child, neglected elder, crazy horse dream, and big chief notebook, who clawed the earth rock for rock who clawed the earth heart for rocks of gold, drank to remember the contours of a circle, insanely danced into the hollowed songs of loss, elated in sweat and paper promises, believed in the safety of words created, tore free their heart from the chest of America, threw bones at chance and became crazy horse killed by a lover. All right, thanks, Ravina. All right, we, uh, we're continuing with our cycle, so next up we have Sarah. Thank you for not moving the mic again. I thought I would do the poem that got published in the Yellow Medicine Review, um, so it's an old one but they're my grandma's stories, so they never get too old. Home for grandma. They took them, all. Father, grandma, great grandma. Agents said either send them or we'll come and take them. Mamas hid us in coal bins, deep forests, 
A few were never found. I think they're still hiding there. Half of us never returned, died of broken hearts, drowned in tears, disappeared in our invisibility. When the beatings killed the Indian in us, there was really nothing left to live for. They brought us in on the backs of trucks, same as the cattle they slaughtered in town on Saturdays. Past a sign I learned read, Red Lake Mission School. Poured what I learned was kerosene over my head, telling me I was dirty. I fought them because that stuff smelled just like the stuff my father told me to never touch at home. Sometimes we strategize in these cold nights, whispers across sweaty, tear-stricken beds, to leave this place, run into the anything of night. But I've seen what they do to those who are trying to run back home. We pretend not to see Arapaho boy, they call him Michael, who ran home, made it three nights in a steel freight train all the way home. Can you imagine his mother's face when she saw him? Hold on a second. Okay. Seven-year-old haggard boy walking up to her tar paper shack on the cold December morning. Can you imagine her mother's face when she saw him? The agent following not far behind, knowing Mike would go back home and took him again. Was she allowed to hold him? Or would she have wrapped her blanket around him and made them disappear home, stopping the civilization at his heart? Arapaho Mike spent two days tied to the churchyard post and ran again. We never saw him again, nor did his mother. I imagine he is one of those unmarked mounds the nuns built in the distance, far enough, close enough for us to see, yet far enough to die to get there. I learned to never run, keep my eyes down, mouth shut, but late at night, me and Josie talk Indian together. I always cry when she speaks, so every time it gets harder and harder for me to answer in what is becoming the words of our mothers. Each time we go to the church, I pray to their God to talk to our God. They tell me that there are two different gods. I ask Jesus to come back and show them what he meant. My little brother, they call him Joe. They don't let us talk to each other, so I don't really call him anything. He wet himself, unable to ask in English for the bathroom. He faced the humiliation of the other children over the whip, rosary, ruler, sure to find his face, back, knuckles, were he to ask in our language. At the rare moments I dare imagine life after this place, I wonder about my children, figuring if I raise them Christian and speak only English, the agents will let me keep them home. Maybe this is for the best. Tell them the stories the nuns told me, half lying to protect them, keep them home. We can hide ourselves in forests deep and silent, and then some days when the Christians leave, we can dig ourselves up from deep tombs, hibernating, impersonating Christians, because all I want to do is go back home. At the train station, I search, conjure the faded shape of my mother's face. I wouldn't even know my name if she called it, because they call me Jane. The years have changed me. Wrinkles in my young skin from years of squinting my eyes over frozen fields, hoping to see her coming for us. All I've been doing all this time is trying to find my way back home. Now I search the roadsides for remnants of buckskin, search for quillwork patterns in grass and ashes on sides of train tracks. I search in, in museum glass for small moccasins beaded by my mother's hands. My feet are bare on this big journey calloused. All I'm trying to do is find my way back home. I spent generations searching for the soil under my feet through red power and revolution, dug through what's left on the reservation. I spent many lives walking along, picking up the pieces, trying to leave the sadness. Backpacks of grief, bags under my eyes, let the alcohol tears pour through my fingers as I pick up our stories. I've decided to follow Arapaho Mike's footsteps until my path north to home diverges dig up the soil around the unmarked graves, and have that old man send them off right to the land my grandma never forgot, and it looked like home.
Wow. Okay, we've heard from our, our, our three expert poets twice. We're going to do another round one more time for each one of them to give them a chance to um, kind of encapsulate uh, their their poetry. Um, and I just I'm so far I've been I've been amazed by everybody uh, by the three of them. Uh, we've heard six very different uh, very different uh, poems and styles and and performances already, and I. Can't wait to see what the next round will, will bring. Um, for this next round, um, you've seen enough of me, because goodness, you don't need me. Um, we're here to see them. So um, uh, after each uh, poet is done, why don't you just uh, come on up? We already know the order already, so uh, you know who needs me to, to do the transition? So um, uh, next up, uh, we're going to start with our, our, our Nick again, and I'm assuming we have an Oreo performance. That's between him and me. OK, anyway. <laughs> All right, Nick, come on up. So this one I will give a little bit of a story on because it, it started here. Um, I wrote this poem called For the Crows in my junior year and I uh, was doing it at the Daily Grind and doing it at open mics and I had such amazing feedback from everyone that it was there or had seen it later online or anything like that that uh, since I called it For the Crows they started, people like within our department and like friends of mine started calling themselves my crows. And it kind of became this thing, and it was awesome. And now I have this big fucking crow in my arm. So when I regret that in 30 years, I know who to blame. Uh, <laughs> well, no, after recent events in the last year, I, I rehashed the entire thing. And uh, now it's, it's one of my favorite pieces. And it's kind of, uh, we'll see if I can get through it. <laughs> this is for the crows. For those that have that cancer called depression, that rogue little thought that sits in the back of your mind growing like a tumor. There are no cures, but there are treatments. Whether it's the thousands of pills behind the counter, or cutting, or any kind of escape when there's never a real escape. I've been dealing with it for years. I used to wear facades, masks that had smiles on them because I wanted everyone around me to smile and not worry while I faked being happy. Until one morning I woke up and said, you know, today is not so bad. And I learned how to be happy sometimes. But not everyone is so fortunate. So I wanted to be a voice. I wanted to be the crow father to those who are misguided, misunderstood, to those who fly with black wings, whether I've known you for 10 years or 10 minutes. I will listen, because that's who I am. I understand the pain of waking up every morning and convincing yourself to love the lie you live, to believe it is more than just bullshit. The desire to see other avian folks spread their black wings with me. This is for those who are too afraid to die alone. This is for the crows. This is for those who are depressed and do not understand why. This is for the crows. This is for those who want to be something greater than themselves but can't stop thinking about taking their own life. This is for the crows. And this is for my little brother, Benjamin. He was the second crow to ever join my murder. He was the littlest of us three, but he had the biggest heart. He taught Ryan and I what loyalty truly looks like. He showed us that you could actually have hundreds of friends, and he taught us that no matter what, when they call, you answer because they need you, and you'll be there. He worried about others so much that he hid his black wings underneath his shirt and allowed no one to worry for him. He never wanted us to listen, even though we always heard his voice. He didn't want us to care, even though we cared too much. So then he left no notes, and then he left. He would have been 18 this last May. Now he lives on forever, 17 in my memories. I will always love you in this life and the next. Those are the words I delivered at my first eulogy. I wish every fucking day it had not been your funeral. And I don't believe in much, but I've started hoping there is an afterlife. Not so I can yell at you and ask you why. Not so I could tell you how much you hurt us. Not so I could preach about how there's always another option. I just want to hug you, tell you I love you, and ask if you finally found peace again. This is for those who think no one's listening when all you have to do is speak. This is for those who think no one cares when you're surrounded by beautiful people. This is for those who are wondering if they're worth the breath they just took. This is for the crows. And this one's for you, Ben, and the hopes that everyone out there hiding their black wings finds someone to fly with before their demons bury them like yours did. So 
So the last piece I read started off with an idea by Adrian T. Lewis. I am in the reservation of my mind. And from there I took on where I, where I, where I think that might have come from. Um, I haven't talked to Adrian directly about that, but if people know the beats, if they know uh, Allen Ginsberg's Howl, if you haven't, check it out. It's in, it's in that catalog style, the idea of these images coming at you and these thoughts and this history coming at you. And so my latest book is Wakpa Wanagi, Ghost River. Uh, Wakpa in Lakota means river or water. Wanagi is spirit or a spirit that is without, that, ha that never had a form, something like that. Um, and so in conceptualizing this book, I do social work as my day job. And being Minikoji Lakota, Minikoji meet translating planters by the water, I come from river people. And so there in the Portland area working with people there, I'm among other river people. And so I start to imagine this, the commonalities of stories, especially within the, the native um, community there, um, the commonality of experience. And so with that, we start to think about how do we undo, unpack intergenerational and, and historical trauma that have affected generation after generation. And with that, I have to look into my family and wonder how do I intervene to make going forward different, hopefully healthier, do the process of healing. And so this piece is called Uncle. And to our uncles, wild to some who still live to hate their father, and to, who, and to us who didn't know our fathers, our uncles approved us. We watched you shut down when our mothers, your sisters, were beat up by their partners. You stood there and let it happen. You see the same memory of your father, mother, slaughtered on some dark res. We mistakenly sing this as love. We men of a brutal legacy drinking our rage to bore out these images. Post midnight uncle, your songs curled anger symmetry, a fugue of great plain stars. Wakpala long grass scores mothers drink to death. Wish it not to our women, but this music transcribed in synapse connection, we doom it to repeat the fiery song cycle. And I imagine, uncle, you as I watching these men distort time syncopated. It's our arrhythmic heartbeat, a ghostly parent and drink flooding this blood. We are the same child going through the motion shown to us. And I recall music from trailer home, dogs in packs, a 57 Chevy flipped on a drive somewhere, drawn out to sea, and your arms holding us through. And we say to you, uncle, who are now grandfathers to our children, why, when the sun down night, born a new day, did we hang over our brains? Some hoops are meant to be broken. Some chorales are meant to be sung and not lived. And uncle, I see all your lives in my nephews, the still melody in us. And uncle, as I am uncle, we are young men who miss our mothers. We are young men who wish our fathers different. And uncle, we have nephews who wait our approval. Thank you. Hello again. I, um, I didn't realize we should be giving some sort of feedback. I definitely don't feel like I have too much um, advice to offer, but one thing that I was told when I started sharing some of my writing was that your story matters and your voice matters and I, that it's important that you share that. And so um, that would be my tidbit. Gifted me. What a gift given me. Yes, yes, I will hold these things, he said. Yes, closely inside this place, a structure to the sky. 
Yes, I can. Place that small pinch in my hand. Yes, gently with my voice. A tremor, these words, they are not mine. With this song, this place for all of us. Yes, and with a little humor, I can, I will, place your heart back inside your chest. The wind, you have the time now to listen to it. Slowly, these things happen slowly. Have you dreamed of this day, they said. Your beating blood touch, touch, back, back, before history was written. In my relentless pursuit of the past, I found a piece of the glowing origin. They told me there is no past, only memory, that we are all here right now doing this. Imagine your father's broken. Imagine him circling. Imagine he, all he heard. Imagine us dancing. Listen gently. Sit, sit slowly. There is nothing but time. Listen. Let this all in. Let your insides hear out. What a gift to hold this universe, a conduit through the mind. What a gift. Carry their voices secretly here. Hold them gently and with some humor. Please give us some of their heart, that strong, strong heart. What a gift. The whole, the broken, the path leading us all here. So much, so many of our stories needing to be told, needing to be forgotten. These blankets I stitch do not feel like enough. How can I gift the cost of my heart, placed so gently and with a little humor, back finally inside my chest? Miigwech. Wow. Okay. <laughs> um, we now we've had our our, our experts uh, share their poetry, um, which was amazing. We're going to uh, move on to our our our, our fledgling our fledgling poets. I'll call them our fledgling ones. Um, we have uh, four. Uh, our poets that uh, were at the uh, spoken word uh, workshop uh, that Marianne Zarzana and I uh, put on on the SMSU campus this past uh, month. Yeah, past month we had a couple of uh, workshops, and uh, we asked students uh, and people from the community to, to stop in, and we would uh, show them and uh, show them some spoken word poetry and talk to them about what that might look like, what it might sound like, some techniques for writing, some techniques for delivery, and we asked them to come in uh, multiple nights. Uh, beyond just the one shot, and then, you know, luckily they all returned. That's good. Um, <laughs> we didn't scare them off the first time. Um, and then we, they workshop their poems. So um, we have uh, four uh, poets tonight that came to those workshops that wrote and practiced um, a, poem, a poem that they did. And so tonight they're going to be performing for you what they wrote and, and practiced in those workshops. Um, and I know... Um, uh, for anyone who's ever uh, performed for anything, coming up and sharing your own work, and I'm sure our, our poets are concerned, it can be intimidating. Um, so please, please uh, give them a, a warm welcome when they come on up. Um, we have uh, four, four poets uh, here tonight uh, after our experts, and they are uh, Talitha Black, Kristen Barnhart, Caitlin Sanow, and Sandra Tao. So the four, now give them a hand, please, yes. <laughs> Um, and we're going to. I'm sorry, ladies. Someone has to go first. <laughs> and and and, and I'm, I'm sorry, Talitha. We are going to go alphabetical. So, <laughs> Kristen, you want to go? All right, Kristen has volunteered to go first. Fantastic. Otherwise, I was going to go alphabetical, which is which is great. Barn, you were right. It is. I'm sorry. I wrote it down wrong. That's my fault. As I glare darts at Marianne. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so the first, uh, our first uh, poet uh, from our from our workshop will be Kristen Barnhart, and uh, please welcome him, her up to the microphone. <laughs> Poofy skirts. Okay, 
Limbo with the microphone. You just get set up where you want to be and I'll make sure it's the right. I have to... This is why I wrote that poem. You're fine. Let me, let me move this and I'll get out of the way. You get set up anywhere you want to. As Kristen's gets situated, I want to remind you um, that we have basically taken over Bra Brothers. Um, so please, please, please give a rowdy round of applause to the staff of Bra Brothers. <laughs> That's not rowdy. Louder! <laughs> Woo! And, 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 and please, of course, I, I, I can't control what, what you do with your checkbooks, but you know, maybe be a little bit more generous tonight with your tips. Um, they have allowed us to come in here and we uh, frequent here often, so thank you so much uh, to Brow Brothers. I'm just gonna toss things on the floor. That's fine, you got it. Let me get it down. So do I just start reading my poem? Yeah, you can introduce yourself. You can say the title. Oh, I'll want. introduce myself yeah, you can a little do your bit. Thing. Yeah. Give some context if you like. You don't have to give context. You can start reading whatever you want. That's good. All right, so. Um, yeah, I'd rather. We don't need another topple tonight. Um, so I'm Kristen Barnhart. I'm a freshman, and I love English. And how I got into spoken word was I can't rap. So um, I really thought that it was a unique but slower and not easier but easier spoken rhythmic art form, and it was a great way to get out emotions that sometimes stay dormant. So um, I'm going to put this back in, and I'm going to read. I see how you look at me, expecting me to be quiet. But if you knew me, you know I can start quite a riot. To those of you shocked I can talk, here's a secret. I never shut up. <laughs> Forgive me for getting up on my soapbox. I forget you don't want to hear what I have to say. I may not be able to stand, but I can speak. And Lord, am I speaking out today. I will be a voice to the voiceless and eyes to the blind. I am here to prove to all of you, that even a cripple can have a mind. Mind you, there's a reason to my sermon, a conversation way past due. So if you'd let me, allow me to enlighten you. The worst part about this disability, it's not me, it's you. It's all the things you think I can't do. Do you know how much that hurts? A person is more than the sum of his parts. I roll, you walk. Let's walk and roll together as we have a little talk. This chair is not who I am. Though it is a part of me, there is so much more to a person than what at first you see. You have not seen my struggles, and I have not seen yours. So now we both know what we've not seen, and we both know that there's more. The list of assumptions is a mile long, and for all we know, they might all be wrong. Looking at a person you can't see inside, and inside the body is where the heart and soul reside. A person is more than the sum of its parts. What makes a person a person is not his mind or his body. It's that a person has a heart. Sorry, I made a huge mess for you, Kayla. <laughs> like always been, right? You're good. Thank you so much, Kristen, for that. I am I am proud to be working with Kristen on the on the uh, SMSU speech team too, so I was it was really tickled pink when she showed up for the spoken word workshop, so um, I'm glad you were, you were able to 
show up. Uh, Kristen, thank you so much. I'm sorry, I forget, that one's shorter than me. <laughs> All right, next up, we have um, a, Marshall, a Marshall native, Talitha Black. <laughs> Okay, like Ben said, I'm Talitha Black. I'm a junior at SMSU. I'm majoring in creative writing and history, and this is my poem. I freaking love snakes. Constrictor, viper, large, small, it doesn't matter. Gaboon vipers, rattlesnakes, boa constrictors, corn snakes, anacondas, tree boas, mambas. I'm not picky, I love them all. The reptile house was always my favorite place at the zoo. I would have to drag my younger siblings away from the elephants and tigers and monkeys so that I could look at potentially dangerous creatures who quite literally lack the part of their brain that would allow them to return our mammalian forms of affection in any way that we can interpret as attachment. But out of all of the vastly different kinds of snakes, my favorite is a humble creature common to the pet trade the ball python. Now, I know what your immediate reaction to hearing the word python is. Python? <laughs> Calm down. It's not a cobra. It's not even a 300-pound anaconda or a 45-foot-long reticulated python. The ball python rarely reaches five feet long and is small enough for one person to safely and easily handle on their own. The first snake I had was a ball python. I was nine years old, and I begged and begged my parents to let me have one of the small ball pythons that someone had brought into my brother's pet shop. They finally gave in, and I named her Raven. I was so proud of my little pet, and about a year later, my demonstration to my wary 4-H club was to feed her a live mouse. The kids liked it, and a lot of them asked later where they could get a snake like mine. I'm not so sure their parents were on board with their grade schooler's new interest. I've learned a lot about taking care of snakes since then, and I'm slightly embarrassed to say I didn't do a very good job taking care of Raven. But I got lucky and had a docile pet, despite my appalling animal husbandry. I have two other ball pythons now, Maximilian and Miranda. They're both morphs. Miranda's a bright yellow and black pastel, and Max's yellowy oranges are broken up by patches of pure white a piebald. Just two examples of the thousands of colors and patterns ball pythons have produced. This little creature is a lot like me. Usually fairly docile, but apt to get snappy when grumpy. A clumsy climber and clumsy about just about everything else. And when I face conflict, I too curl up in a ball underneath something with my head protected. At times, I wish I was more of a cobra. Fierce, easily provoked, willing to strike out to get what I want. Or perhaps more anaconda. Simply big and important enough to have everyone leave me alone so I can be lazy to my heart's content. Or perhaps the flamboyant coral snake. Bright red and black and yellow standing out as an attractive warning, beauty hiding the potential to kill. Or rattlesnake and garter snake, masters of camouflage hardly ever noticed. So many other snake traits I wish I could have. But when it comes right down to it, the ball python and I belong to the same den. Friendly when you earn our trust, personality when you get to know us, and just weird enough to only attract the right people. Thank you, Talitha. Um, it's actually, I had another uh, fantastic honor. Talitha was uh, one of the people to introduce uh, um, one of my panels uh, this uh, week at the Marshall Festival, which was uh, really great. And uh, so she introduced a, a panel I was on on uh, Thursday. And uh, the, our next poet actually introduced uh, my other panel that I was on today, earlier today. So this is kind of a, a unique uh, happenstance. I don't know how that worked out. Just just happened to work out that way, which is fantastic. Our next poet is uh, Caitlin Sano. <laughs> All right. My 
my name is Caitlin Sano. I actually just started to go to SMSU. I'm technically a senior, but I think I have one more year left. <laughs> and this is titled, Since I Was a Little Girl. Since I was a little girl, society has taught me to start my day with an important question. What am I gonna wear today? My clothes define who I am. From too little to too much skin, I am either old fashioned, prude, proper, tease, slut, ho, whore. Who am I today? Since I was a little girl, when I go outside, I keep keys interlocked in my fingers. Mace on my keychain turned on and at the ready. I must be prepared. Headphones in? Music has to be off. My eyes ahead, I have to be aware. If I am to be attacked, the culprit will most likely be a stranger on the street than my boyfriend in the bed. Since I was a little girl, I was taught that men will loiter. Hopefully they notice me. Hey, yo, sexy, nice ass, can I get your number? It's a compliment. I'm flattered. How I react defines who I am. If I ignore them, I'm a cunt. If I acknowledge but say no, I'm a tease. If I give them my number, I'm a thirsty hoe. I'm asking for it. I was taught that in class and in work, the man sitting next to me will stare. He'll think about my performance. He'll wonder why I'm there. If I do my job well, I'm a bossy bitch. If I do my job poor, I'm looking for a husband? I'm a gold digger. Either way, he'll think about putting me in my place, and he knows just the way how. If I need to relax, I go to a bar. My drink must always be attended. I must be aware. Don't go alone. I must be prepared. Call someone, a friend, my boyfriend. It's okay, I can trust him. He brings me home and the argument starts. He wants sex, I don't. Everyone does it, you must be weird. Don't you love me? If you did, you would do it. I decline again. I want to wait. I'm not ready. I say, let's talk about this tomorrow. I'm tired and tipsy. He doesn't leave. I'm with him. I'm asking for it. Ever since I was a little girl, society taught me that it's women's job to prevent sex at all costs. It's men's job to want sex at all cost. Ever since I was a little girl, I knew society was wrong. Thank you, Caitlin. Our, our last poet for the night uh, is Sandra Tao. And, um, I'm pretty sure, if, if my memory serves me correctly, that at the first workshop that we did, um, Marianne and I were, were introducing ourselves and, and talking about what poetry meant to us and, and, and how uh, uh, poems and performance can be an impactful part of your life. And I'm pretty sure I said something really inappropriate to Sandra. I don't remember what it was, but um, I'm pretty sure Kristen has reminded me constantly about what I said. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm, I don't remember what it was, but I definitely said something inappropriate accidentally. I'm sorry. <laughs> Do you remember? I don't, I don't know. But Kristen? No, 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 no. Let's just not repeat it. Um. <laughs> All right, please welcome up our last poet of the night, Sandra Tao. Oh, good. Kind of short. Sorry, I'm like shivering. I feel really cold, so like my teeth is like chattering, and then like I have a sore throat and a runny nose. I'm sorry, I'll do my best to, you know, enunciate and, you know, say what I need to say here. Um, so I'm a bio major. <laughs> I'm a bio major, and I'm here, spoken words, writing, right? Um, I'm also a transfer student, but then 
even though I'm a bio major, I have a thing for writing, and I think this thing is so cool. So um, I came up with something. Um, this topic was based off of something that I had to like write about, and I got this idea in my head at like 12 a.m. in the morning and couldn't stop writing until 7 a.m. Ended up having 10 pages of like ranting about this topic, and then I'm like, oh, I need to condense it for this, and so I condensed it into three pages. <laughs> So um, this is my title, Little Mong Girl. Little Mong Girl, your parents love you. You are their pearl. As you grow older, you will see how beautiful your life can be. But how sad when I hear your tales. You hate the Hmong in your alleles. You despise your culture. You cannot detect beauty in the traditions you should protect. You should not hate the Hmong genes your parents gave to you, can't you see? Every strand of your hair and pigment of your skin is a gift from the heavens who sent you to be their kin. These days you say you don't want to learn Hmong. So your Hmong is weak, but your English is strong. But Hmong is the only language your parents can speak. Hmong is a language that is unique. You complain of the traditional clothes, they're old fashioned, no skin shows, yet you will wear the five pound silver necklace and don't complain of its cultural ugliness. You say the Hmong community is unwelcoming, uncivil. To be part of their culture is non-beneficial. It's been 40 years since our arrival in the US. The culture has thrived and seen much success. You tell your parents that you wish you were never born into a Hmong family because you want to ignore the dirty past of the culture, want to forget the old ways a daughter is expected to marry at a young age. You are correct to a degree, Hmong culture is not all that pretty. But throughout the years, the Hmong culture has changed. We've let go of traditions that are deranged. Why lie to your peers of your racial ethnicity? saying that you're either Korean or Japanese. Don't try to burn away traces of your Hmong culture. You will not survive socially any longer. You point your finger at your parents, telling them they are stupid and ignorant, racist, immigrants, and uneducated. You say their knowledge is outdated. When you point your fingers at your parents, you are being disrespectful and aberrant. Look at the three fingers pointing in your direction, then answer these questions. Do you know why your parents are immigrants? Do you know why your parents cannot speak English? Do you understand that your parents are the foundation for you to receive a good education? Do you not see your parents' drudgery of keeping up with the American economy, especially when your parents are immigrants and couldn't understand any words being spoken to them? Take a step back and look at yourself. You cannot change the spiritual wealth of the Hmong that's deep within you, engraved in your skin like a permanent tattoo. You should be proud of your culture and identity, no matter how bloody the past may be. You may have a lot to hate, but there is way more to lose if you completely cut yourself off from your roots. Learn your culture and your language. Learn to love the Hmong part of your lineage. Learn to embrace the wonders of your traits. Learn to accept that you were born into a beautiful fate. Just like your parents, you are living in the land of the free. Together as a Hmong family, expand your family tree. Keep the traditions alive and you will see how truly beautiful your life will be. All right, that wraps up our uh, poetry for tonight. The, the power of spoken word has been on display tonight. I've been, wow, this, is, this has been a fantastic evening for me. Um, I want to, uh, on behalf of uh, Marianne Zarzana, uh, I'd like to say thank you so much uh, for coming out tonight to this event as well as to the Marshall Festival. Um, it's been amazing to see so many supporters um, of of the written word and the spoken word. It's been absolutely fantastic. And I'd like to thank our, our poets. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Nick, Trevino, Sarah, of course, uh, Kristen, Talitha, Caitlin, Sandra. Thank you so much for coming out. And again, thank you to Brow Brothers for allowing us to be here. Um, please stick around, uh, visit, talk with the poets, uh, talk with uh, uh, each other, and enjoy yourselves tonight. Um, and uh, please drive safe home. Thank you. <laughs>